The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, and some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. So parents, I want to apologize right now. I think the clay may stain a little bit. Just heads up. Yep. Uh, and uh, and y'all need to know that your other pastor here is a very uh, wonderful sculptor. This little pig and this duck is phenomenal. You got to look at it afterwards. Today we're talking about the Trinity the Holy Trinity, and I want to thank Amy Wuhardo for these new banners up here for our Holy Trinity Sunday. They're absolutely beautiful. Um, so when you see her, tell her thank you um, uh, for that wonderful gift. And uh, the Trinity is an interesting concept because if you look even at these, these uh, banners, it shows one line kind of swooping to create three different shapes in the middle there, and you never know where one ends and where one begins. Um, and this concept of the Trinity was something that we created, humans created. It's not in the Bible. The word Trinity can be found nowhere in the Bible. If you find it, let me know, but it's not there. I promise you, it's not like Waldo hiding somewhere. It's not there. The Trinity is not listed in the Bible anywhere. But the nature of it, the concept of it is. And we have that language, the Trinitarian language that comes to us. Like in our gospel lesson today, Jesus is looking at the disciples who are kind of floundering in their faith. Some are doubting. Others are trying to understand. It's the end of Matthew. And he gives the Great Commission what they're supposed to go and do now that they've received everything. And he says, go and make disciples. Well, how are we to do that? By baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then there's more. Teach them everything that I have commanded you, and I'm going to be with you always. So there's always this sense that they're together with Christ to teach everybody what Christ has done and that Christ is with them and that they continue in this deep relationship. And so the, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit language that's used in there doesn't really even take center stage, but it's that relationship aspect that Jesus is always with us, the Holy Spirit is always with us, we are never alone. And then Paul writes and uses this Trinitarian language multiple times, whether it's in the beginning or the end, and we're very familiar with these phrases, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Very good, Lutherans, yes. We know this language. We use it all the time in worship, this Trinitarian language. But, um, and I've preached a lot of sermons on the nature of the Trinity with all the different analogies that are used. But I got to tell you, at the end of the day, it's about a relationship. It truly is about the relationship between God and, and Jesus and Spirit, but also us as well. And the best way that I can think about uh, describing this comes through our first lesson, which is the story of creation. And before we jump into Genesis 1-1, we need to know where we're at in the story, the greater story. And I know what you're thinking. It's the beginning, right? I mean, it's right at the very beginning, but it's really not. It's really not. So this, this story, uh, Genesis, even from like chapter 1 to chapter 11, were all probably compiled and put together during what's known as the Babylonian exile. When this group of people came in and around 700 uh, um, before the common era, and they just took people away from their homelands. And they, they, they took them, and they enslaved them, and they took them off to other distant far lands, and all of a sudden, they're now without their temple, without their, they feel like they're without their God. Where is God in all of this? And the prophets are writing to them, saying, God is with you, right where you are. And this is when the story from Genesis 1 through 11 gets kind of compiled together. And we know this because of the language that's being used in it. Um, uh, and also the stories that are being told. So the concept of, of, of Noah and the flood, that, that, that God's going to remove sin, but then save humanity, and that God is a grace-filled, forgiving God, uh, uh, that Abraham, with all the chosen ones, that they are part of this chosen people, and that God will not forsake them, that they will be so much numbered as the stars in the sky. And so these people that are living without thinking that they're separated from or being reminded on a daily basis from these chapters. And one of those comes the story of creation, 
about the nature and character of God. But there are two creation stories that we have here. And, and we're going to be talking about Genesis 1, which is the first creation story in the Bible, but it's really the second creation story that was written. And the second creation story in the Bible is really the first story that was written. Um, and if you follow my math there, then you're in good shape. But the second story is the one with the two people and the tree and the, and the fruit and the serpent and then, and then chaos and they're kicked out of the pool, you know. Um, uh, so that's the, sec- that's the first story. And we know that because the word God that's used in that one is Yahweh. And so the word, that's, that's the, the, the word that was used, the earliest form that they could find of the word God. The story we're reading today from Genesis 1 is Elohim. And that was a later understanding of God. So we know that this one was written after. Now, these people that are living in exile are hearing all kinds of creation stories, creation myths. There's stories out there about the stars that are gods, the sun is a god, the moon is a god, the the heavenly bodies are gods, and they all work together to create the world. There's also the Babylonian creation narrative that's out there. And this is what's called a conflict narrative where there's two opposing forces that are battling against each other and creation happens. And the story is called Enuma Elish. I don't think I'm saying it right, but it doesn't matter. That's what it's called. And uh, um, uh, in this, there's the god Marduk. And Marduk is this creator god that works with all these other deities to battle this giant sea monster called Tiamat. So Marduk and all these other deities are now in this battle against Tiamat, and they wrestle, and, they, and they, they win the day, and they defeat Tiamat, and then Marduk splits Tiamat in half, this great sea monster, and from it creates the heavens and the earth, and that's how it all came to be, according to the Babylonians. So these people that are living in exile are hearing all these other things, but all these creation stories deal with multiple deities doing all kinds of stuff, and what does ours talk about? One God. In fact, in our creation narrative that we have, that we're getting ready to look at, it's God who creates the heavens and the stars and the sun. And it's God who creates, even as it says, the giant sea creatures. So do me a favor. I've been waiting to say this for a long time. Open your Bibles up to page one. And let's look at this creation narrative. So these are the, the, the people in exile are, are, are hearing this story over and over again, and you're going to notice that a lot of phrases get repeated, um, which in storytelling, that's good because repetition strengthens and confirms, and so these people are hearing these same things over and over again. So common phrases like, and it was good, and, um, and the repeating what had happened the day before, those are important, and we're going to find out why these things are so important. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and this is when we find out that the earth is a formless void. Darkness, chaos is covering the face of the deep. And then there's this wind from God. And you may remember last week we talked about this word wind. It comes from the Hebrew ruach or the Greek pneuma, and it means wind. It means breath. It also means spirit. And it says that it swept over the deep. But a better translation, and I really like it, is hovers. Because hovering over the deep kind of lets you know that it's never going to leave. It's just always there, and it's kind of moving over this deep. This, this spirit, this breath, this wind is constantly moving. It's not just going to sweep by, and it's gone. It's always present. And so right at the very beginning, you have God creating. There's the spirit that's moving, and then God speaks light. And then God says it was good. Now, that's an important word for us to know. Now, that doesn't mean the opposite of bad, like we would understand it today. But whenever this was being uh, spoken and and, and heard and written down back then, good meant something that was ordained. It was something that was supposed to be. Or what I'm coming to understand it is divine purpose. So this light from the word of God and the spirit hovering has divine purpose. And part of that... Siri is going to say something, sorry. And part of that is that this light is to be separated into day and night. And then God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters. Let's separate these waters that the Spirit is hovering over. So now 
there's water above, and the Spirit's with that, and there's water below, and the Spirit's with that. And God called, the, uh, uh, called it the sky, and it was evening and morning, the second day. And then he said, let the waters under the sky start to gather together. So now the Spirit is moving over the waters, and there's land that is appearing, and he wants to call the land earth, and he calls the other sea, and he calls it good, because it too has a divine purpose. The light is still there. The Word of God is still there, and the Spirit is still hovering all over these things. And it was good because it's going to produce vegetation. And all of these things are going to start growing up. And you're going to notice one key element in all of these vegetation is there's seeds that are involved, which means it's going to continue this. It doesn't stop that God's creation is even in the smallest, the tiniest of seeds, that the word, the light, and the spirit is available even in the smallest substance, and they will continue to bring forth vegetation. And, of course, it says God saw that it was good. It, too, has a divine purpose as well. And then God said, let's go ahead and take these lights and let them separate out and have one over the day and one over the night and let the stars be seen. And so that way we have these seasons. And now all of a sudden there's rhythm to life and the spirit is available. The light is there. The word is there and the vegetation is growing and it was good. It also has a divine purpose. And then, because then all of a sudden in this seasonal thing where the, where the water has been separated and the vegetation has now grown up, now the creatures start to appear. And it says, in the water let the be living creatures. Birds fly above and, in the, and, and so below. And so God created the great sea monsters. What a comfort to those people in exile to realize that it's God that created that. And then all the winged creatures of every kind, and, 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 and then also I love where it says the waters swarm. It brings me back to the Spirit hovering, the Spirit moving about, and God blesses them and saw that they were good. They also have a divine purpose, and that's to be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and fill the air, and then there's more animals to come on the land and the cattle and all the creeping things above all the ground, and God saw that it too was good. It also has a divine purpose, and then it shifts. God says, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over all these animals and creepy things upon the earth. That word dominion carries with it a lot of weight, but it doesn't mean to extort power from, it doesn't mean to lord over it. Dominion right here truly, truly means to care for it, to be the steward of it, to protect it, to make sure that its divine purpose is fulfilled. And so these people that are made into the likeness of God are meant to care for everything that has already been created for its own divine purpose. Let's make them in our image. So God created humankind in God's image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, both with divine purpose, both divinely made, both divinely equal, and both for their own divine purpose to tend to it. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. I have given everything all the seeds, all the animals, so that they may have life and you may help them to have life. And God saw that it was indeed very good, that this purpose was so good, a very divine purpose. And then, of course, God rests on that seventh day. This is such an interesting thing for these people in the exile to be hearing because surrounding them is an opposing type of power that they're not used to this type of power. They're used to people taking advantage of them, taking them and pulling them places they don't want to go, doing things they don't want to do, lording it over them. And now they hear about this, this wonderful creator God that says your purpose is to care for all of creation and each other in a different way of power. In fact, I'm sharing my power with you in the same way that I created and I brought down light and word and spirit. You have the ability to do that too and you should be sharing that with everyone else. In fact, those Babylonian captors of yours are also, they have a divine purpose. They may not be living into it, they may be blind to it, but you're called to love them that way. And there will come a time when you will come back together. And so as they learn and as they grow in, these, in, in, in learning Genesis and reading these things, they eventually do come back. And they do come back to their homelands. And this narrative stays with them all the way up until today. But what about us? Because ultimately, what do we do with this knowledge now that we have it, knowing that we too have been divinely created for a divine purpose as well? We are co-creators with God in this beautiful creation that's been given to us. And we have 
God, and we have the Word, and we have the Spirit, and this beautiful trinity, this relationship, and we're invited into this dance, as it were, that we're not there to direct it, we're there to just participate in it, to see that every other person that's around us also has a divine purpose as well, and that they have been created by the same creator, and they are equal to us, and that even the plants on the ground, and the trees surrounding us, and the animals, and those giant sea creatures... They're also divinely made, and we are to care for it. Not to take advantage of it, not to exert power over it, not to exploit it for our own selfish gains, because if we do that, then we are acting a lot like the Babylonians did. And we do that, y'all, right? I mean, we still do that. We wrestle with that on a daily basis. So today we're being reminded, you have been created good with a divine purpose you have been made in the image of God, and it's one that's to be in relationship with God, with spirit, with Jesus, with word, but also with each other and all the things that God created. And that's why God says we are indeed very good. Amen.